morning, everyone. And welcome to our second Saturday lecture series for September. Um, before we get started, we have several announcements about upcoming programs and events. Um, today is going to be Saturday for families, and we actually will be celebrating women's suffrage. Um, you can stop into Amy to learn more uh, about, about the struggle and pick up a free grab and go activity kit with materials to make your own dressing cell and suffragist pennant. Um, these kits can be taken home or completed at the carefully sanitized table in the lobby at the Elder Folk Home Rectory Museum. They will be available to press points for. This is our first come, first serve basis. The Civil War Roundtable is on Wednesday, September 16th. Dr. Charles Fennell Jr. will present the, the work with Pellet, the Fight for Cult show on July 3rd. This program will be held virtually. Um, and you can visit our website for more information on how to view this program. On September 23rd, all vets will welcome Jeff Hines, who served in the Army from 1984 to 2003. Jeff served as a combat engineer and served in the Middle East and Afghanistan from 2001 to 2003. Um, you will have to pre-register for, uh, for this uh, event, and you can find details about that on our website. On September 26th, from 1 o'clock to 2.30, we'll be hosting an oral history training webinar. We invite anyone interested in learning how to conduct oral history interviews um, to participate. This is a free event that will be conducted by Gary Loveland, who will discuss oral history interviewing and his work with the LGBT Center of Central PA. Um, Gary will be joined by Dr. Monet Ab Abdul Nahid, and she will discuss the importance of cultural competency when working with underrepresented communities. Like I said, this webinar is free, but registration is required, and you can visit our website for details on how to register. Also on September 26th, um, from 11 to 1, um, I'll be there. Um, demonstrating the separation and cooking techniques of 18th century cooking over an open fire in the yard um, at the colonial complex and be able to observe, ask questions, and I will have recipes that you can take home and try. You can also visit the tavern kitchen garden. Um, so drop in anytime from 11 to 1, and there will be uh, things happening at the, at the colonial complex. Um, be aware that you should dress for the weather and Wear a mask and practice social distancing, even though we are outside. One last event to watch for October 1st, Friday. This will be an online program. Uh, you can watch our social media to hear some local ghost stories and the events that inspired them, as well as some spooky themes played on uh, by Richard Fry on the Santa Bird organ. And then last, October 2nd, Saturday, will be on October 10th. Topic is finding justice, an untold story about women's fight for the vote. It talks about a band of intrepid women and their one ton bronze bell, which you can see a replica of at the History Center right now. Um, Amanda Owen will be conducting the, the speaker for that for that um, second Saturday, and she's an independent scholar of women's history and the co-founder and executive director of the Justice Bell Foundation. Today's speaker is Joy Latina Council, and Joy is a retired nurse and gynecologist. Her work with the terminally ill has been featured on national television on 60 Minutes and Film, A Matter of Life and Death. Joy has written two books, Brief Companions and Insights on Death and Dying, and has published a number of articles. Joy will speak about her experiences working with the terminally ill and caring for AIDS patients at the York House Hospice during the height of the AIDS pandemic epidemic here in York. And so I will turn the remainder of the time over to Joy. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chris. It's been um, a real honor to be asked to present about York House. And um, I, I want to start with how I think we are our brother's keeper and how we treat each other with love and care is more of an intrinsic reward than thinking, well, we're just doing this for the good of, of all. But we get rewards from it too. I 
so those five years that I had your cow were, of course, unbelievably rewarding. I was working at uh, North Charles Hospital in Baltimore, and Hopkins bought up and closed up. And so I didn't have a job. I had my little farm in Airville, and I thought, you know, I don't want to lose this farm. So I will give it a try for about six months to see if I can get a job in thanatology. So everywhere I interviewed, people would say, well, you know, people are dying anyway. They don't really need anybody to help them through that time. So it was very difficult to get a position. So one day I was sitting under a wonderful pine tree on the farm and digging in the dirt. And out of the ground came a little plastic letter A, the kind that children have a magnet behind and they put it on the refrigerator. And it sort of hit me that this was for AIDS, which was rampant in the country. Pennsylvania was about sixth in the county of the amount of AIDS patients that we had. And I thought, you know, this is a skill I have and the need is out there, so why don't we enmesh this? So I went into York and talked to uh, Bernie Earhart, beloved friend, who was already working at housing uh, people with HIV. And he said, you know, there's a building on Duke Street that the city owns and it's empty. And I thought, you know, maybe we could have a hospice house because patients with AIDS, many of their families had disowned them and there was no one to offer care. So my old friend Sue Schmidt got me involved with somebody at the mayor's office and Mayor Althouse said, well, yeah, you know, I guess I can let you have that house. You can rent that if you pay the property taxes. So I said, we can do it. And off we went. So it took this cadre of volunteers to convert that wonderful old brick house on Duke Street into three rooms. If we had more than three rooms, beds for patients, you had to be licensed as a personal care home. And I really didn't want to get into that. I wanted to keep this just simple and good hands-on loving home life care. So we got um, the Bradley Academy of Art involved and they took us as a, their design project. And those students would come and show me the wallpaper they wanted to put in this room or how they were going to upholster the furniture in the, in the living room. It was just this, this wonderful coming together and so every day I was there stripping wallpaper and we got the, the uh, Carpenters Association to come and, and tear out the old tin tub and put in a good, good bathroom shower where patients could just step gently into the shower because they had some neuropathy in their feet. And um, everyone just said yes. It was this wonderful project. Restaurants provided sandwiches and pizza for all the volunteers. Uh, we just did this together. Then I went to York Hospital and, and the Memorial Hospital and said, these are some things I need. I need three beds. They said, okay, I need a crib. Because at that point we had children with AIDS. I need my nurses to get hepatitis C vaccines, okay? So everyone just said yes. And it was this feeling that we're in this together. We know what the problem is and we know what to do to fix it. And we're gonna to work together to do that. So I hired nurses and they were all devoted and um, a good secretary who certainly kept things flowing well and a housekeeper. And she cooked at the same time so that if a patient didn't feel like eating breakfast at that time, whenever he wanted breakfast or whatever breakfast food he wanted, she could provide that. And it was just this whole sense of patients knowing that they were loved and cared for. And maybe at no other point in their life would they leave a legacy about their life. So one day I was there working and I noticed on the side of the building in paint was painted Crips. And 
that was a gang in New York. And so I saw one of the fellows sort of loitering around, looking scary. And I said, hey, I need to talk to the main guy. Well, I, well yeah, well, I'll, I'll have him here. I said, two o'clock on the steps. So two o'clock, this guy pulled up, you know, you know, pretty tough looking guy. And I said, listen, here's what we're going to do in this building. And a lot of my patients have been drug addicts. And that's how they got HIV and AIDS. And we will have medications in this building that I need to protect. And many of these people have been living on the street. And I'm going to provide them with 100% cotton sheets and wonderful tea and loving care. And I need you to protect us. Well, he just puffed up and said that, yeah, you betcha nurse, I, I could do that. Rather than me have an altercation with him and, and set up that, he took that role <laughs> amazingly. And so that was his area, his, his hood, and he made sure that we were taken care of. My nurses would come and go at all hours of the, of the day or evening to go see patients and bring family in. I would go assess people down on Pine Street and wherever. And it was always, it always felt safe. So we started getting referrals because there was nothing more to be done. Once you had AIDS and the system was very compromised, patients weren't going to survive. I got a board of directors set up and they were, again, volunteers, people who cared enough to, to sort of help shore up the project. And I needed a physician. I needed a medical director. And who was there but David Hawk, good old Dr. Hawk, who specialty was public health. And he was at that point a medical director of the city health department. You know, I never asked Dr. Hawk why he did it, but he said, okay. And it was an honor to work with him. And he would come for rounds every Friday and see each patient and make order changes, maybe to increase morphine or to cut back on a certain medication. And it was always safe to know that he knew what he was doing. I would follow those orders and the nurses would follow those orders. And then another fine, fine, sweet man was Father Carter, a Capuchin monk from the Spanish community. And many of our patients had Hispanic backgrounds. Some didn't speak English. And this was such a, a sensitive conversation that we had to translate. And I remember Jaime, a Hispanic fellow from Adams County. He was a migrant worker and would be picking apples in Adams County. And you know, they, they lived in concrete buildings close to each other and, and very little comfort measures. And Jaime was pretty sick and only spoke Spanish. And so I went to assess him and, and told him through the conversation with other workers where he could come to stay. And he agreed. And we put him in one of the three rooms and a beautiful bed and and wonderful, clean, soft comfort for him. And Dr. Hawk came to do rounds and I called Father Carter to come to translate. And it was a difficult conversation because Jaime would ask in Spanish when he could get well and leave. And Dr. Carter then would translate that in English back to Dr. Hawk. And Dr. Hawk would say to me, what, what should we say to him? And I said, Dr. Hawk, you've got a wonderful heart. You, you tell Dr. Carter and, and he's got a wonderful heart. And it was then that Jaime understood that he was there to die. And I think he accepted it. He was very gentle. And when he died, we found family 
in Puerto Rico, but they wouldn't take any acknowledgement that they were related because they didn't want to pay for a funeral. And so the funeral directors in Europe were always burying our people, just lovely. And so I had Jaime's body cremated and I put his ashes in a, a false graph vase on the mantle in my office. And when we closed Hospice House, I took those ashes to the vineyard behind my farm and I scattered them there. So what we did was to constantly give for five years the dignity and the love that we had. There was, there was no judgment and patients felt that. There was always safety that they knew they were given the best care that we could. And there was a lot of comfort care. Some patients would become short of breath and we did not install oxygen. We had small fans that would give air, the sense of air across their face. And my wonderful nurses would give hand and foot massages. We would give small doses of morphine that took away that drowning sensation. And the comfort, you could just see the patient settle down. So it was always this hand on. And we knew how to do it and, and we did it well. So the National Hospice Foundation decided they wanted to do a huge uh, representation of hospice at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington. It would be a photogra photographic endeavor. And we were chosen as one of five hospices to do that. And so Jack Radcliffe, who was teaching photography at Harford Community College in Maryland, came to the hospice house. And every Friday after rounds with Dr. Hawks, Jack would take photographs of the patients to this representation at the gallery. And it was years of, of photography. And we always asked patients permission. And we always told them they could say yes or no anytime they wanted to. But again, it was a sense of legacy that we made some worth out of the tragedy of dying so young and with the disease for which we had no cure. So one day there was a knock on the door and the young woman was standing there with a brown grocery bag. And she said, I answered the door, we were busy with something. And she said, can I uh, come here to die? And I said, yes. And she said, well, I'll be right back. I have to do something. I said, all right, the door will be open for you. I don't know where she went. This was Sheila. And Sheila had had to be a prostitute in her life to get money to buy drugs. So this, this young woman was in trouble and had full blown AIDS. And so she did come back. And she was able to walk up our beautiful stairwell. And we had one patient in one room, so I had two beds left. And I asked which one she would choose. And she chose this particular room. And it just felt good to, to keep her safe and, and warm and fed and, and loved. But then the doorbell rang about an hour later. Flowers for Sheila. Well, it was a huge bouquet of flowers. So we had to, of course, pay the guy who brought these flowers and take the flowers. Sheila, there's flowers here for you. Oh, good. You know, I figured that at my funeral, I wouldn't get any flowers. So I ordered those for myself. I said, well, okay. So we made a beautiful vase and bouquet full of flowers for her. Then the next day, knock on the door, uh, pizza for Sheila. So she had the yellow pages on her bed and a phone, of course, 
and would call and order all these things for herself. Of course, we all paid for this for her. And she would get her photo taken, and Dr. Hoff was very good with her. And this was Sheila. And she had an array of these uh, negligees in, in her beautiful silk of different colors. And she would have her nurse, Georgia, lay them all out on the bed. And she would choose which one she wanted to be photographed in that day. So Jack, would, Jack Radcliffe would come up from Baltimore, and Sheila might say, no, I don't, I don't want to do it today. And Jack would be very kind and say, all right, you're in control. You don't have to do that. Um, and about a month later, she was, Sheila was really starting to fail. And uh, it was difficult to take her out of bed. She, she just was uh, sleeping a lot of the time. And my secretary was getting married. And the nurse came down the steps and said, Sheila wants to see you. So I went up and she said, um, so Steffi's getting married. I said, yes. Uh -huh. She said, I, I want to give her something. Can she come up to my room? I said, sure. So I went up and sort of stood outside the doorway because this was between Sheila and Steffi. And out of this black patent leather purse with the broken clasp, among the old Vic pen and the lint filled lifesavers, Sheila pulled a dollar thirty seven in change and said, Here's Steffi, this is for your wedding. And the love that passed between two human beings, one who was ending her life, and one who was going to enter in the very joyous part of her life. And it was such an honor that we set the place for that to happen. Set the place. I got a call from Lancaster General Hospital about a little boy. And he had AIDS with a huge fungal ball in his chest. This was Boo Boo. And his daddy called him Boo Boo because he reminded him of Yogi Bear's Little, little chum, Boo Boo the bear. A little Hispanic boy who was born HIV positive from his mother. His father was, had been addicted to IV medications and uh, passed HIV on to her and she passed it on to him in utero. And he was five, Boo Boo. And I went to Lancaster General to assess him, and I found him in a crib, a large crib, with both hands and feet tied with restraints because he had a little feeding tube into his nose and tummy, uh, and they didn't want him to pull that out. And plus, it was a route for morphing. And I said hello to him, and he said, can you please get me out of here? And I said, yeah, we're going to leave today. I got my car right out here. Are you ready? So I untied him and carried him to my car and drove him to your house. And um, he was pretty weak, but he insisted on walking up those, that stairwell. Didn't want to be carried told me he was the man, and I believed it. At that time, 
we had a room with a crib, and he said he would not get in that crib. So the, out it came, and in came the adult bed, because he was the man. So he, he wasn't taking feedings at all. We only knew, needed the tubes to give him morphine. And, and occasionally I'd have him have a little uh, Kix cereal, or Captain Crunch cereal, and I'd say, okay, boo-boo, you can chew it and get that sensation of eating, but you can't swallow because it'll block the tube. Oh, okay, he thought he'd be like, I'm sure he swallowed some, but the tube never got blocked. And Father Carter used to come to him and, and whisper Spanish prayers to him and comfort him. His mother was unable to come up from Lancaster very often. She had to get a ride. And, and Luz was sick too. And so it was difficult for her to promise him that she would do it. She would promise him that she would be there on a certain day. And he knew one day. And I'd take him downstairs in the living room and he'd sort of sit over the back of the couch and look out the, the window for her car. And frequently the car never came. And he would be so disappointed. So I called, um, I forget the name of the firehouse there on the corner. But I would call and say, hey, um, you guys, boo was at the window. Can you uh, run a fire engine by and do the fire <laughs> And then, here they come, boo boos. Here comes the fire engine. And they just all can do their thing for him. Then his mother would come to visit, and she would leave her purse. And he would keep that in the bed with him. He uh, was starting to really fail. Uh, but we kept him totally pain-free, which was really, really good. And I took him out on the back porch one day. It was uh, the day before his birthday, his sixth birthday. And we had gotten him the Mickey Mouse kit from Disney, so he had the ears on and the little shirt. And, and he was just leaning against me, sitting on the porch, and he had a balloon. And it was red. And I said, you know, Boo Boo, you can like that balloon. Lift off anytime you're ready. And he said, well, I'm not going to do that tomorrow because it's my birthday. And that would make my mother very sad. So a few weeks passed. He was in coma. And uh, my nurse was on with him. And it was a Sunday. And her husband was preaching at, at the local church. And she decided to go there and listen to him. One of the other nurses took her place. And she hurried from the church to go over to the parsonage for something. And in the bushes was a red balloon. And she knew Boo Boo had, had cried and died. And she quickly called the hospice and, and Shirley said, yes, he's lifted off. I visited his mother and brother in Lancaster and I went into a third floor walk-up. <clears throat> and there was a lawn chair and a mattress on the floor. And the, the brother, about 12, was sitting in it. And Luz made him get up so I could sit in the chair. And she said, I... I'm in trouble, sick, I'm sick. I need to, to come to you. And I don't know what to do with my son. I said, well, let's 
work at getting him in Milton Hershey. <laughs> I don't know how these magical social workers did it, but they did. They got the young boy into Milton Hershey. And Luz came to Yorktown. And we had two rooms empty that day. She came by ambulance. And the ambulance drivers lifted her up in that litter and carried her the whole way up those steps. We weren't going to get an elevator and we weren't going to get a chair lift. We carried our brothers up those stairs. And I said, Luz, would you like this room? Or this little room is where Boo Boo died. And she said, oh, I want, I want that room. Earth Gladfelder's secretary, Lucretia, had given us three angel lamps for in each mantle of each room. And they were like night lights. And it was just a soothing, beautiful thing to have them. And the patients loved them. And the one in Boo Boo's room, the light, the bulb had gone out and I, none of us had remembered to replace it. And Luz was in the bed in which Boo Boo had died. And she was only with us several, several days, very sick. And the night light went off. And we all said, well, that, that little stinker is around here. And then I would get calls at midnight at home. And my night nurse would say, Boo Boo locked me in the bathroom. Well, how would that be? Boo Boo is running up and down the stairs and he's up in the playroom. And so there was all this activity with that little boy's spirit. And finally we said, you know, Boo Boo, your mother needs you and you can go be with her. And it's, it's okay to go now. You've done your job here and, and we need to make room for other, other people to come to us. And then we didn't, we didn't have any activity from it, but he was a sweetie and we, we sure loved him. One day Jack was there to take photographs and we had a young man who was an artist and his dad came with us with him and he would help around he'd stay at the hospice house and help fix the furnace or do whatever we needed done and he was such a lovely man it was tough for him to see his boy dying, but we, we cared about him a lot and we appreciated all the work he did. He was kind of your uh, football coach kind of guy and, and he never chastised his son for, for being gay or for contracting a deadly disease just loved him till the end and we were so honored to have him there and he would occasionally buy lunch for the nurses and just little treats but it became he was part of our family too this is a difficult picture for you to see but it's reality and it's it's death I was called to see uh, a young woman who lived above the, I don't think it's there anymore, the old TV repair shop on Penn Street. And I went upstairs and it was not a very nice place to be, especially when you're sick and dying. And so I said, Judy, I want you to come with us and we're gonna take care of you. And she was reluctant to leave. And she said, do I have to eat what you make me eat? And I said, no. Can I sleep as long as I want to sleep? Yes. Okay, then I'll come. So she came 
and was very ill. And um, Jack came to photograph her, and she died that day. It was a, a very unpleasant surprise for us. We had hoped to sort of get her a little more comfortable and, and safe, but boy, she, she died quickly. And Jack took her photograph. And I think the artist in Jack found the beauty in us. I had the name of her boyfriend. Now, he didn't live with her, but he was in her life. And so we called him and said, uh, if, if you'd like, you need to come down to the hospice house that Judy has, has passed. Well, he was very upset and hysterical. And he got there and ran, and ran right up the steps and into the room and closed the door and locked it. And Jack is there because he's not, he's, he's done. He has taken this beautiful photograph, but he was getting ready to go back to Baltimore. And he wasn't going to leave us because now we have this big burly guy who's not on the best of terms with all of us and locked in the patient's room. So we allowed him to be there for several hours. And then I knocked on the door and said, may I come in? And he said, if you come in, I'll punch your teeth. Oh, well, I'm not coming in. But we couldn't let this go too long. So another half hour would pass and I gently knock and say, I need to come in. I need to get a lock of Judy's hair for you. And you will make it tied with a ribbon and you can keep it in your wallet. Of course, I hear the door open. And he was distraught. He didn't realize how sick she was. And I don't know how long they were together, but he sure loved her. And I said, I need your help now. We got the lock, and he put it in his shirt pocket. I need your help. The funeral director is here, and I need you to help them carry Judy's body down to the hearse. Well, nobody's touching her but me. I said, that's just fine. Can you carry her? He said, I can. And so he put her on the litter, and he helped transport that litter down to the hearse. And so the closure that he got was a, a very quick death that he, he wasn't prepared for. At least we gave him some semblance. And one of my nurses drove him home. He didn't live with Judy, but she drove him home and stayed with him and got him a little dinner. That's the kind of care we get. That's the continuity and the, the love that went to everybody. I got a call about a box behind the library in which Randy was living. A box behind the library. And Randy was sick. And we brought him to the hospice and he had a bed there in a beautiful room, but he always wanted out on the porch. And he said, I just can't be in. I've never lived in. Ran away from home as a young child, child, a 12 year old. Lived on the streets and, and contracted AIDS really pretty quickly during the pandemic, during that epidemic. And Carolyn loved him. She, she 
she was a wonderful LPN. And each of my nurses seemed to have their favorites, you know. But Randy was the waste. And Carolyn loved him. And she would let no other nurse take care of him. And he, he really knew that he could wrap her around his finger. And so Carolyn would spend cold days out, out on the back porch with Randy wrapped up and Keith was wrapped up. And he had a birthday with us. And he never had a birthday cake. So of course, Randy got himself a real good birthday cake. And we got him a pair of mittens and, you know, socks, hunter's socks that had a battery in them that would keep his feet warm so he could stay out on the porch. And Randy had his first and last birthday with us. The love and, and the care. So what we were about was being our brother's keeper. And I think we see that today. And, and the need to have love conquer fear. York was a very German, Lutheran kind of town. And you bring a sexually an IV transmitted disease for which there's no cure. And that's scary. But you work opened its arms for us. Donations came flowing. I needed them. That was the only way to pay my nurses. I was giving a speech at the Rotary one time, fundraising, of course. And uh, a fellow in the back said, well, you know, I don't know why we should be helping these people out. You know, they brought this on themselves. I said, well, sir, you know, I see there's a pack of camel cigarettes in your pocket. And when you get small cell lung cancer, maybe we would say, well, you brought this on yourself. Why should we help you? Well, the light bulb went on, and I saw him reach for his checkbook. So what happened was people knew we were there, and it was a way to help the helpers. That, that was short time. We got referrals, of course, from Lancaster, York, yep, Home Care Agency, and Hershey. And Hershey never gave us a penny, but we took their patients. Many were very complex people with, with tumors that invaded their neck, a uh, lot of sick patients with Hershey. But you know, we said this is, this is who we are and this is what we do. I had great, great volunteers that would come and sit with patients. Great volunteers that did fundraising, constant fundraising for us. And then the anti-retroviral medications started coming along. And that was wonderful. This is a very difficult disease to treat. The, the virus could mutate easily. We still don't have a vaccine for AIDS. And so the medications started saving lives. And we were a hospice. Hospice is for dying patients. And so we weren't getting many referrals. And it was this bittersweet time. So Bruce Bartels at York Hospital said, it's a, good, it's a good place you have there. Well, thank you. Why don't we turn it into uh, something for cancer patients and, you know, a respite home for cancer patients? And York Hospital will run it. 
Okay. Well, you know what I think. Uh, and so I went to the board and said, you know, this has been my baby. And thank you all. But we have no patients now. And I think I need to close up. Our time is up. We've been here when we really were needed. And I've been honored to be here. And, and I think every patient who came to us, every nurse who cared for them, every volunteer who walked in the door, and those guys from CRIP, it was all the right timing for us to be with each other. And AIDS was getting treatable, and I wanted that. And so we had no patients. It was not honorable to ask for donations. I had no nurse. My nurses weren't caring for anyone. And so we took a vote, and the board said, OK, very difficult day. And so we closed up and we sent notes out to hospitals that we weren't open anymore. And I couldn't find myself leaving. I couldn't, couldn't lock the door. And so I would go to work every day <laughs> and close off and and then there was an agency in Lancaster, HOPE, H-O-P-E. There was an agency in York that were doing AIDS. And so we, we gave furniture, we gave medical supplies, we gave our library, we gave our medications to them. And so, something I'll always be proud of doing. You know, you can't rest on your laurels. So we, we have to look out for each other in any way we can now. I know people who have had AIDS for years, HIV negative now, just wonderful, wonderful progress. So thanks to your, what all you've done for us and to rest in peace for those that came to us. So I'm happy if there are questions that have been called into Chris that we will entertain. We haven't, we haven't gotten any yet, but let's, let's give them, we haven't gotten any yet, but let's give people a few minutes. Any more questions? Well, okay. Yeah. Well, we can talk a little bit more. Um, <laughs> let me see who we had here. We have, Well, we have Richard. This was one fine fella. And he, uh, I, don't, I don't know how Richard contracted AIDS. And actually, it didn't matter, did it? And this was Corey, his sister. So we had both of those siblings at the hospice at the same time. And Richard loved cheeseburgers from McDonald's. And of course, we would go get them for him. And then he would have a gallbladder attack. And then he'd say, you know, I think I need to go to York Hospital and get my gallbladder out. And I said, well, Richard, I think what we'll do is we'll cut down on the, the McDonald's cheeseburgers and fries and, and maybe go a little bit, little chicken and, and rice dinner. So he accepted that that was okay. But it was, it was something to have and Corey and Richard were not at the exact same time. Richard did die with us. And uh, Corey would come to visit him as sick as she was. We had a young man whose father was in prison. And we had to arrange for him to come visit his son the night he died. And Terry was in coma, and 
the doorbell rang. It was about eight o'clock at night. And all the rooms were filled. And I didn't want the other patients to see the police coming in with a patient in an orange jumpsuit and shackled, handcuffed to a chain at his waist and cuffs around his ankles. And I said to the policeman, you gentlemen can untie him from this. He doesn't need to be seen by anyone like this. He's coming to say goodbye to his son. And well, we don't we don't want him running out the back door. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. And so I asked the cook to make them a little cup of tea so they could sit quietly in the living room. And up the stairs, this gentleman went, head hung low. Hadn't seen his son for a while. He'd been in prison. The son had not visited him, visited him in prison. And he came, we put him into the bedroom, got a chair, got him some tea and comforted, and closed the door because this was a very private time for him to say goodbye. And none of us knew what he said to say goodbye. He only stayed 15 minutes. We don't know what he said. We, have, we told him he could stay as long as he wanted. He could stay through the death. He didn't, didn't want to do that. And then, of course, the police hooked him back up to his handcuffs and, and a chain around his waist. And, but at least we got him to see him. And, and that mattered a whole lot. One day, a young man from Lancaster who had gotten an award for being the best waiter. I mean, I mean, this guy could take your order and it could be 10 people and he'd get everyone right. He really knew his job. And his father and mother visited every week. And one day Dr. Hawk said to the, to the father, I'm so sorry this is going on. We're, we're grateful that you're visiting. That, that means a lot to him. He said, Dr. Hawk asked him how he felt about losing his son. And the man simply turned his back on Dr. Hawk and said, I have other sons. Anyway, his mother would stay for long periods and We'd had a guest room upstairs that I said, I think it's a good place for family to nap or stay overnight if they wanted. And I took his mother out on the porch while the nurses were changing the bed and, and providing care. And I looked at this woman, and it's the first time and last time it's ever happened to me. I saw a green aura around her head. And it was a color I've never seen. And it was jumbled. And you know how our aura is, that if we put our hands together, we can feel that almost a rubber band pull. And when we're light and loving and kind, our aura is big and it goes out. It's our spiritual aura. And she was so tight and frightened that the aura was close to her, it was green, and all fractured. And the pain she was having, and she couldn't share that with her husband because he had another son. And so the, we tried to also provide to our family ways for closure and support after the death. Uh, many of my nurses, our nurses went to funerals. Uh, we kept in touch for one full, full year after the death. Some mothers would come and want to help at the hospice. And we would say, thank you. We're going to see that you help somewhere else. But right now, you're still in pain. And you're still trying to heal. So we don't want to add another boy's death to you. 
So the care was complete and full. And we knew what we were doing. Yeah. We do have a few questions, Joy. Um, well, first of all, we have, a, we have thank yous coming in for sharing your amazing story. And Nicole Smith, who is our director of li our library and archives, said that this will this recording will be some part of our library and archives collection. Oh, wow. What an honor. Thank you. Yeah, and she would like to know if the Corcoran catalog is still available. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Um, you know the Corcoran Gallery is no more. I'm sorry, this was of five hospices, all photo photographs of dying patients, and it is not available. It was, uh, it was published then, and um, probably that was about 94, and it was only available at the Corcoran Gallery. So I'm, I'm sorry it's not. And then we do have another question um, from Parthena Bowman. How do you care, take care of yourself and the emotional challenges of this type of work? Uh-huh, how do you take care of yourself and emotional sanity? Well, First of all, you have to be honest. You can't pretend you're not being affected by losing people to whom you're attached or family. So to be real, I think you have to have a philosophy of life and death. And if that has been sustaining you all your life, it will sustain you through death. If it hasn't, you need to get one that will. So whatever that philosophy is, uh, it better be the one that works for you. Um, the old saying, if you don't believe in something, you'll fall for anything. Believe in something. My belief system is of reincarnation. And I believe there was no coincidence that every, every patient with whom we came in contact we were supposed to be together at that time and perhaps finish a relationship that we would we had had before that that was what sustained me also that i don't believe there is any death that i could say richard your body is dying but the essence of you can never die and I think that helps patients, that this is not just who we are. We are something else and that we go on and maybe we come back again. So you have to be honest. Sometimes it would be very difficult and I'd have to play as hard as I worked. But I always had a sense that I was okay I would check with my nurses and they were safe to say to each other, I just, I just can't go in Boo-Boo's Boo -Boo's room or I can't, I wanna go see Judy's funeral and I need the day off, we'd say fine. So we understood the impacts of this and their families were good with them. They had to take their work home too. So we thanked their families and, and friends for the, for the love they gave them and support. Okay, so I think that's it, and um, we'll, we'll wrap up. I'm not even in, but I hope everybody can hear me. Um, we're going to wrap up this uh, second Saturday lecture. I want to thank Joy for joining us today and sharing these very touching stories and, and for the love that she brought into, into, into the city, <laughs> into the county, and, and those she cared for. So thank you, everyone, and, and um, we'll see you uh, next month or another program or in the museum. Thank you, my honor.